Hello, everyone. Yet once again, it's another day of fresh grace and mercy. This is the Guilt, Grace, Gratitude podcast sponsored by Logos Bible Software, where we bridge the gap to Reformed Christian theology for your listening pleasure. Today, we're doing a book club episode with Harold Sankbeel, and he wrote a book called The Care of Souls, Cultivating a Pastor's Heart. And it, um, we're going to be talking about here this in here in a moment. It's uh, published by Lexham Press. So if you guys go to our show notes and hit that Lex Impressed link, it'll take you right to this book. And then some more information about Harold and uh, some of and what he does and what he's up to. And also just uh, some other information and links and resources for you guys, how to find a reformed confessional church near your area. So a link to that to hit that link and type in your zip code. Just other information and resources of how to... Uh, access our podcast and and utilize it so you can find us on social media instagram and twitter but also you can find our conversations recorded via video for youtube so just type in our podcast name to youtube and you can watch these conversations that way if that's more your jam so i actually am doing a little new thing for our book club episodes where i read a endorsement um based on the book that we're doing the, today the one that i'm gonna do and i'm just flipping through the page is actually a father from a father of a former guest that we had on uh david zoll we had on so this this endorsement's from paul zoll and it talks about this from for harold's book it says in the care of souls harold sank draws on decades of hands-on parish ministry to offer a rich handbook for parsons and priests. I say handbook because it's almost all here. The practice of listening, the attentive diagnostic analysis of acute suffering, often repressed or displaced, that everyday people live with and deal with, the alternate pitfalls in ministry of giving up or hyperactivity, the inner psychological side of surviving critics in the parish, and perhaps my favorite imperative, pray out loud. Pastor Harold has an eye on contemporary issues such as pornography, the proper Christian resistance to, to cultural confusion and denigration, and the computer age. He comes across as an old guy who is wonderfully compassionate, nobody's fool, and absolutely Pauline in discipleship and practice. In short, I wish Pastor Harold were my local minister, but if he can't be, at least I got his book. So I'll let Peter further introduce Pastor Harold today. Yep, this is uh, Reverend uh, Harold Sankfile. He's uh, a de- executive director emeritus of Doxology, the Lutheran Center for Spiritual Care. His pastoral experience of nearly five decades includes parish ministry, the seminary classroom, and parachurch leadership. He's author of numerous books, including Dying to Live, The Power of Forgiveness and Sanctification, Christ in Action. We're actually be talking about a few other books that are kind of spinoffs of this in the Lexham Ministry Guides, but <clears throat> it's a pleasure having you on, Reverend Sykebell. Wow, what a joy to be with you. <clears throat> Thank you for getting up so early. As my You're- father used to say in the farm, you have to get up before breakfast to uh to start your day here that's right, that's right. I, I like uh i ha- i so i usually go to the gym in the morning um mm-hmm. I, I always go to the gym in the morning but it depends on like what time and i have to like if i don't wake up about an hour before i'm yeah. just not i'm not like i'm just not there mentally yeah if it's within an hour your just brain is not there yeah no that's yeah so it's just not <laughs> it's not happening so it's it's both for like kind of um it's it's my devotional time but it's also like my brain needs to wake up before i do anything else Mm -hmm. um but so yeah for those who may not know who you are and know you're worth that that much but maybe let our listeners know a little bit about yourself your your background and what you did for the past 50 or so years doxology all that good stuff okay yeah so yeah 51 years in the ministry now Mm -hmm. and counting and uh so the uh I, I I often joke that I've retired about four times. In, <laughs> That's in right. Yeah. Field of ministry, um, but now I'm a, a full time grandpa and father, mm. as you can see in the background here, <clears throat> and um, and I also write books, and I speak occasionally. So uh, okay. this is part of the occasional speaking, I guess you might say. Yeah. So I began 
<clears throat> my ministry um, in 1971, um, mostly in small town and rural areas. Mm -hmm. Um, 1976, I moved to Madison, Wisconsin, and was a mission planter there, okay. and uh, then suburban Milwaukee, Elm Grove, Wisconsin, in uh, 1979, 1980, and uh, uh, 86, I should say, and then uh, and then was called to the seminary in Fort Wayne to teach there for uh, six years. Um, so I. Some I retired from that, moved into parachurch work, uh, doxology, mm -hmm. uh, which is a training program <clears throat> in the care of souls, advanced skills, utilizing the insights of the uh, longer tradition of uh, uh, soul curate, which is what the book is about, mm -hmm. and also uh, contemporary Christian psychology, the best of that. My colleague, Dr. Yankee, mm -hmm. was highly instrumental in forming <laughs> that, that work. Uh, which continues today under a different leadership. Um, so I, I have I've kind of one toe still in doxology, uh, leading the uh, collegium of graduates. Um, we have a, a group of uh, fellows in that collegium who, who guide and direct uh, some of the thinking on contemporary issues from the viewpoint of the uh, classic view of the care of souls. So that, that's a very exciting kind of life for me. And uh, so I'm happy to share what it is, what little bit that I've gotten to know over the uh, over the decades, and that's kind of <laughs> out, I guess you might say. Yeah, it's yeah. a good book. Yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't say it's a little bit. I would say it's a lot of bit. There's a there's a lot we can we can learn from from you and your and your ministry. And so maybe <clears throat> first, what we can ask is, uh, you've been you've been in ministry, like you said, for over four, five decades, and you ministered to to thousands of got to guess souls. So in answer to this question, you've already kind of I'm going to touch on this, but maybe to, to fuller develop it is uh, what led to writing this book um, at this point? What are you hoping to do with it? Okay, well, the formation of doxology took quite a while, it began over 25 years ago in conversation with uh, Dr. Yankee, the clinical psychologist, and we compared what it is that therapists do and what it is hmm. that pathologists do. We did some research into the longer history, and that's where we kind of stumbled on the insights of the ancients when it came when it comes to the Kura Anamaram or the care of souls. And then lo and behold, this is a, a part of our Reformation history, both Reformed mm -hmm. and Lutheran, and the whole spectrum now really of, of Christendom. So uh, it's not like we have to reinvent the wheel. Um, the insights of these early um, uh, soul physicians really provide guidance, I think, for contemporary pastors as well. So uh, early on, Dr. Yankee was saying this might be worthy of a book. And I said, well, yeah, yeah, that's an interesting idea, idea whose time has not yet come. And then, as I say in the forward, I was I'm blessed with a very obstinate and persistent, uh, very close friend, Lucas Woodford, who just got on me and said, you got to write this. Hmm. And uh, finally, I, just out of self-defense, I sat down and, and tried to codify this, which is essentially distilled from the lectures that I provided through doxology hmm. and conversations over the uh, years with uh, hundreds of pastors. Hmm. So um, he um, also was uh, saying, now you got to write a chapter on parish administration. And I said, I hate parish administration. And he said, well, that's why you need to write it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> then my editor, Todd Haynes, I believe you've had him on your podcast, yep. said the book is too long. So we peeled off that portion about, <clears throat> about parish administration hmm. planning, which uh, Lucas had written. And that's is the first volume in the series, The Lexa Ministry Guides, Pastoral Leadership for the Kids. Oh, okay. So that all began as one project, and then the spinoff <laughs> came from there. Okay. Yeah. So I have to blame Lucas, I guess, for this book. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll thank Lucas for this book. We, we won't blame him so much. Okay. And uh, I don't know if we mentioned this yet, but uh, the, the forward was written uh, by Michael Horton in the book. And you're good friends with Michael Horton is, is if you guys get this book, read the forward. It's, it's great. Um, fed Michael Horton on our show a few times. Uh, Peter's taken classes from him. 
as well. Uh, so, uh, and then this book also, I, it's me as a lay person. Um, it was a good, as most people are lay people, <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. it's a good re- reminder of who pastors are, what they should be. Um, I I'm blessed to have a great pastor, but, uh, it's good to just understand the, the overall perspective of this an- broader evangelical world that we're living in, especially in Western world in America, pastors seem to be in the broader evangelical world, a little bit more celebrity culture, maybe kind of seem like CEOs more than anything or motivational speakers or prosperity pe- preachers. I mean, all you got to do is flip on or TV and try to find like a Christian TV station and you see kind of that, that kind of appeal. Right. But what you more appropriately call them, uh, which are way more biblical is, is there's, you call them soul doctors or even sheep dogs. And then more commonly, I think we've heard, uh, pastors are called shepherds. Um, but I, I really appreciated you saying soul doctors and sheep dogs. So could you maybe, uh, explain those terms for the audience? Yeah, well, you're absolutely right. Uh, ministry has kind of been reinvented in the last, I would say, probably 75 years hmm. after the image and likeness of uh, <clears throat> kind of um, public media and public gatherings of all sorts. So yep. you have a group of people in seats <laughs> before a stage with a, and a guy with a microphone gets up in front. So the, <laughs> it looks for all the world like a lecture or some sort of entertainment venue. And um, the organization itself has lots of activities. So the skills of administration and leadership come to the fore. So automatically the pastor becomes a a chief executive officer, as you say, of a a complex organization. Um, So this of course is not the longer heritage of the Christian church. And for that, you look to the Bible itself. And when you get into the pages of the Bible, you see that the teaching of Jesus is in a very agrarian Uh context. (laughs) So his parables are all agricultural primarily, (laughs) um, both in terms of raising crops and also animal husbandry. Now, it just so happens that I was (laughs) born and raised in an agricultural environment, which is woven throughout the book. And uh, (laughs) so I learned a lot of hands-on things that brings me into the world of the Bible already. And then you begin to look at the work of the pastor as one who is um, a farmer, so to speak, cultivating uh, what it is that God wants to raise, namely um, people for his kingdom. And uh, so the, the seed, as Jesus says, is the word of God. And that seed grows as um as he cultivates it. Hang on just a second. Okay, so yeah, so I grew up on the farm, and there I saw every day what the Bible's talking about. <laughs> My father and I were engaged in actually raising crops and tending animals. Mm-hmm. Um, so the imagery of the Bible is not really an imagery, so to speak, it's actually what is going on, because in relationship to God, who is the shepherd, Psalm 23, right? The Lord is my shepherd. We are all sheep. Sheep are dumb animals. <laughs> not just, You're calling us dumb? Not just because they can't talk. <laughs> because they're actually yeah, stupid. totally. And they need a lot of guidance or else they're going to perish. Totally, yeah. So uh, that's the way we are. And uh, so the Lord himself tends his flock um, by means of his word and his sacraments and provides them the uh, life and the healing, the food, the nutrition that they need in order to grow in its kingdom. There's all kinds of predators out there. Uh, so he wards them off and guards and keeps them as well. <laughs> now, so the pastor, the word pastor itself actually means shepherd. Mm-hmm. And um <laughs> Now, I ran across some years ago this analogy of the pastor, not as shepherd, but as sheepdog, which speaks to me a great deal because the relationship of, uh, of the pastor himself to the people is an intermediary. He doesn't really honestly do the work of shepherding. 
Jesus does it, properly speaking, mm -hmm. by means of his word. He just kind of shows up <laughs> and dishes out the goods. He <laughs> proclaims the gospel. He administers the sacraments. He applies the word of God, both law and gospel, in appropriate ways, in appropriate proportion <laughs> for the unique circumstances of each individual soul. Hence, he has to have the eyes and ears <laughs> of a physician. It was uh, St. John Chrysostom who said that the uh, pastor needs a thousand eyes to examine the condition of the soul from every angle. So um, the pastor simply doesn't really know what to do unless he listens to Jesus by means of his word. Hmm. Now, if you can see over my left shoulder in the far end of the, of the hallway, there mm -hmm. is a thing of, of Jesus with a dog. And the dog is really looking at at Jesus. And this is the relationship we want to cultivate as pastors to, mm -hmm. to always pay attention to Jesus, to look to him for guidance, for our security, for our protection, and then also for our guidance. Um, an analogy, uh, a lady by the name of Evelyn Underhill said the, uh, the dog really doesn't know what in the world is going on when he's going after the sheep. They're running all, all over the pasture. But he listens for the guidance of the shepherd, and he does what the shepherd wants. And no matter how difficult his task is, his tail is always wagging because he knows that's what the <laughs> shepherd wants him to do. Hmm. So uh, that image kind of really spoke to me, and it's spoken to hundreds of pastors wherever I've told them that story. Hmm. Well, that's big figures prominently in the book, too. I say that the pastor is really just an errand boy for Jesus. Hmm. Yeah, and that's my dog here. Citric is a little. <laughs> I was about to say, if it's a sheep dog on your left and a, a dog on your right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> this is good. Yeah, this it speaks to me because this is this is a, a ministry that I'm in, although not ordained yet, kind of in, in supply as uh, acting as a pastor until I'm ordained. So this again, this speaks to me. So um, building building off the last question, <laughs> you describe. At many points, that being a pastor, you've, you've talked about it a, a little bit, um, and exercising your call is both a, a science and an art. And my guess is neither of these, like we said, kind of the last question, are the first things that come to people's minds when they think about a pastor. It's like, why are you talking about science and a pastor? And why are you talking about art? A pastor is just a counselor or, or whatever whatever people may think mm -hmm. he is. And so they may not think of these at first. So can you describe... <laughs> why you call pastors to cultivate both the science and art of their, of their office. Yeah. One of, one of my great heroes is Eugene Peterson, who the late Eugene Peterson and many of his books, he, he kind of unpacks this as well. He says in too, too many people's minds, the pastor is like the jaunty foreman of a self-improvement crew. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Get people to do things mm -hmm. or the activities director on a cruise ship. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, that's, you know, when you go by the externals, that's the kind of definition you come up with. But then you look at the real, uh, what what's under the hood, and you look at the scriptures themselves, and you see that there's far more here. There's great mysteries, profound mysteries, eternal mysteries to be unpacked, <laughs> unfolded, and to be disseminated. So that has to be done with great care and sensitivity and uh, do it in a, a way that's appropriate to the circumstance. So you need to have an intuition on one hand, kind of a, that's what I call a habitus that's mm -hmm. developed over the years. But then there's a body of knowledge. It's called theology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's called the word of God. Uh, so this is the science that's behind pastoral care. Um, and just as a, a good farmer would ideally learn a lot about agriculture and a lot about plants and a lot about animals, but then it's in the application of that, <laughs> how he tends the plants and the animals, uh, that things really come home <laughs> for him and for the enterprise he's engaged in. So the science, the body of knowledge, <laughs> the, the truth of the word of God, and then the art. <laughs> um, the art of soul care is like you the art of um, the medical doctor. You know, a doctor doesn't just go to school to learn anatomy, physiology, uh, pharmacology, and so forth. <laughs> but he learns how to apply this. And his so-called bedside manner, his intuition, mm -hmm. and together all the moving parts of the health and welfare of the patients, 
is what makes him a good physician. Yeah. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, <clears throat> so there's, uh, you mentioned throughout the book uh, that you learned some lessons the hard way. And when it comes to the ministry of Jesus's love and not your own internal, internal love and compassion, but looking more, relying more outside yourself on Jesus's love and trying to replicate that, how does this play itself out into day-to-day -day ministry? Yeah, well, of course, uh, the, uh, the, the care of the pastor is genuinely caring, and you can't be, uh, you know, aloof and separated from people and be a, a faithful pastor. Um, you emulate, uh, you express, you convey, actually, the very love of God in Christ Jesus. And God, who is love, expresses himself ultimately in pouring out his love for us in his son at the cross at the open tomb. But then he moves on from that in his living word to provide us with the very light and life that is in Christ Jesus. So at every moment of ministry, you're engaged in this active expression, dissemination, you might say, um, unveiling of the love of God. Um, now, early in my ministry, I recognized, of course, there's a lot of hurting people. And, and as a Christian, your heart goes out to people. Um, so I assumed yeah. it added one and one, and I got two. If you have a hurting person, I, I have a compassionate heart. If I put the two together, then they're going to get better. Well, it was helpful <laughs> in a crisis situation. But what I found quickly is I ran out of compassion. Uh, I didn't have it in me to carry the load of other people plus my own burdens. Uh, so I wasn't particularly helpful uh, to that individual. It's, it's a little like when you go on an airplane and the uh, the flight attendant says, if uh, in a case of emergency and there's a lack of oxygen and cabin pressure, these masks come down. And if you're traveling with a person who needs assistance, what do you do? <laughs> Put on yourself first. You put your mask on first, mm -hmm. then you can tend to the other person. So you need to give to others what you yourself have received. That's the point on pastoral ministry. I'm just a channel. Yeah. And so maybe I'll, uh, I'm going to preface this question with something that you pointed out. And I didn't have my questions in the front end, but I think it's really helpful because you talked about the habitus, kind of the formation of a pastor, which is a big point of your book. Um, and I think it's really helpful for younger pastors. And you talk about this again, there's a, a few interactions you have with younger pastors on like how this pastoral heart is cultivated in us. And mm -hmm. it's not like an immediate thing that we kind of just grow into or like we learn how to be pastor in the first moment. So maybe how does this, how does this pastoral heart, how is it formed and shaped into us? And how are you, like, like you said, habituated into being a pastor yeah. of God's flock? Well, you learn by doing. I think that's the longer history in any profession worth its while. It's the same. Um, I don't care what what activity you're involved in, but but let's use medical um, uh, the medical field as an example. You know, a doctor might go away. He might become a specialist in a certain field of medicine. He has this whole body of knowledge, but. It's in the application of that for the health of people that mm -hmm. everything comes, comes home. And for that, he needs not just the uh, this whole wealth of knowledge in his head, but he also has to have a heart for, for medicine. He has to have a heart for suffering people and to bring that healing to bear with, for them. He needs to copy what he's learned from other caring physicians in mm -hmm. the past. So it, it is a corporate enterprise, I, I, I think the ministry is. And rather than just emulating these uh, flashy um, heroes of the megachurches as being our sole image for what an effective pastor is, let's learn from those who've had, who've learned over, over the decades of the School of Hard Knocks of just yeah. simply being with people in their suffering being with people in their sorrows, their burdens, their concerns, their doubts, their worries, and uh, and how it is that they are comforted, consoled uh, by the healing word of God and the power of his sacrament. Yeah, and so and I think that's that's probably a better lead up into into this question because and again you make a huge point and, and both Nick and I can heartily agree with this is 
kind of a kind of a staple of reformational pastoring, which is its its base and its its growth and its its kind of umph comes from the the simple word in, in sacrament ministries, the the means of grace that uh, that really helps care for souls. And and again, that <clears throat> not saying that it goes against the grain, but that's that's kind of not what you're taught by a lot of other you can call them seasoned pastors or a lot of kind of pastoral ministry handbooks and here's all the ins and outs and you don't really get the uh the simple means of grace word and sacrament ministry um so why why are these so important for the care of souls and maybe not kind of the the other stuff that you may hear from other people well simply because they are a channel they are a means of god's grace his unmerited favor in christ jesus um so and Jesus said, go and, and preach the gospel uh, to every nation, uh, baptizing them and so forth. And so um, it is the word of God that affects reality, not ideas. God so loved the world, he did not send a committee. He did not <laughs> yeah. send a yep. bunch of ideas, but he yep. sent an embodied reality. Uh, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So he sent his very heart. He sent himself. And so Jesus comes to us by means um, by means of these external channels of the proclaimed word and the sacraments administered. Mm -hmm. Now I have to hasten to add that it's not quite. A, I mean, some people fall overboard on the other side and they say, "Well, see, it's a matter of of just um, <laughs> the right truth at the right time." Yeah. Um, dogmatic theology is in itself is not healing, and Jesus is. And the yep. word of God can be divided into, into dogma and to be described in, in dogmatic terms. But it's not as simple as saying, well, take these two Bible passages and call me in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Yep. You know, it's rather bringing, uh, facilitating a conversation between Christ Jesus and this suffering soul. And that's what you're engaged in as a pastor. And, and there's nothing like it. It's an amazing thing to see God at work and the Holy Spirit active uh, by means of these channels. I want to bring up biblical joy. I thought that was really good in the book. Uh, how can pastors exhibit love in action, leading their congregants to biblical joy rather than a fleeting happiness we so often long for in this world? Um, more worldly joy, I guess you would say versus biblical joy. Um, you share some incredible stories in the book where you might expect people to lose all hope and joy. And yet through the simple ministry, through the simple ministry, uh, the Lord gave you, they don't. So maybe kind of talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Well, um, Jesus said that his joy is to do the will of the father, mm -hmm. see, uh, the love of God in action through what he did is what he, what kept him going. And uh, so even the very last night, as he contemplated the awesome, fearsome um, prospect of his suffering and death as a sacrificial victim for our sin, and literally pleaded that if possible, the cup would pass from him, he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So joy is found in doing the will of God. <laughs> and uh, happiness, on the other hand, is, is self-fulfilling um, pleasure, which is great. I love it, too. But um, but happiness is a fleeting thing. It's here today and gone tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, joy, on the other hand, can be experienced in the midst of sorrow. And, and unless you've really uh, suffered with someone and um, borne their burdens, it's, it's hard really to grasp that reality. Uh, so um, that's why the apostle could say, count it all joy. Mm -hmm you experience these various sufferings um so um because you see that god is at work and undercover so to speak um undercover the opposite uh, this is what the reformers call the theology of the cross god is at, mm -hmm. at his highest when people are at their lowest <laughs> and uh so you win by losing when you're with jesus you know, um, you, uh, if you seek to save your life, you'll lose it. If you lose your life for me and for the gospel, you will save it. So invest in yourself in the midst of sorrow and suffering is you find that uh, God is at work there 
You see God's hand in action, um, providing consolation, comfort, and care for, uh, through what you're able to provide. And you have the satisfaction of knowing then that you are an agent of God in the midst of that suffering. There's where joy, I think, is found. Um, whereas on the other hand, if you're looking just for happiness and success, you might achieve that for a, a brief period of time, but it will not sustain you for the long haul. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like happiness is kind of more dependent on what we short term experience in this world and ho biblical uh, joy is more experienced on hope and what Jesus has done doing and will do. Yeah, but the main thing there is that it's not just for future, like the, as the old <clears throat> saying goes, a pie in the sky by and by. Mm -hmm. It's not a delayed right. pleasure, but rather hope. But joy is found in the midst of suffering. Mm -hmm. as you recognize that God is at work even here, <laughs> and he's mm -hmm. sustaining me in the pits. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of um, Martin Luther's... <laughs> more provocative writings i find is his commentary on the magnificat and he comments mm -hmm. the mother of our lord and says uh, you know the um my soul magnifies the lord my spirit rejoices at god my savior for he's exalted the low estate of his handmaiden you know uh, those who are lofty he brings down those who are poor mm -hmm. he lifts up so luther comments this he says god is far-sighted <laughs> <laughs> Man is always looking up into the heights, but God is looking down into the depths. And sometimes he places us lower so that he can see us better. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Yeah, Luther's got a he's got a good way with words. And he's yeah. he's provocative. I like it though. That's and, and above that's, all, he's he's a pastor. That's he thing. is, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he doesn't get enough play as a pastor. People think of him as a theologian. He's totally a theologian and, and lecturer, but he's he's in the trenches of ministry. Yeah. Absolutely. This next question is kind of is based on the chapter on spiritual warfare. Uh, it's a really helpful chapter in the book. Um, some some reformed people might have came to the reformed church that used and they used to be more in a Pentecostal church. So when they move over into the reformed church, uh, they experience the simple means of grace uh, in the Word and the sacrament ministry. So they feel like the the spiritual warfare kind of doctrine or topic or whatnot theme doesn't come up as much airtime. So, but um, I think that might be um, a misunderstanding as well. That could be a, maybe a more of a broader answering question uh, for another time. But so can you describe uh, the warfare? There is a real sport, spiritual warfare. We're not ignoring that. Can you, can you describe the warfare pastors and the congregants face and the tools or a tool they have we have to fight it yes well of course it's all over the place even in the prayer that our lord taught us deliver us from evil is deliver us from the evil one lead mm -hmm. us not into temptation so uh, the christian life is lived on a spiritual battlefield <laughs> that goes with the territory mm -hmm. the problem is of course that the uh, <laughs> The Pentecostals overemphasize this to the extent that they see the devil under every rock, so to speak. And mm. so it's understandable that people having kind of been burned out on that would yep. turn away, shy away from it. Mm. I think it's helpful to know two things. First of all, means of grace theology is really the means of the Holy Spirit. Mm. Um, the Holy Spirit calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth by means of the gospel preached and the sacrament administered these are the tools and the instruments of the holy spirit uh, so you're engaged constantly in league with the holy spirit when you're preaching the gospel and you want to do that faithfully according to the written word because the written word is inspired by the spirit it's full the words of jesus are spirit and life he said to his disciples <laughs> So he conveys his Holy Spirit, he gives his Holy Spirit by means of that word. Now, the fighting, the warfare part of it is very, very real. You know, St. Paul will say to Timothy, fight the good fight of the faith. Uh, but this is not to conquer territory for Jesus. Um, rather, it is to defend uh, uh, God's people against attack. And the uh, the famous um, uh, description 
of the spiritual warfare in Ephesians. <laughs> um, Stand therefore, having your loins corded about with truth, uh, taking the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation. It's interesting that all those armaments that are described there in that text are not the is not the equipment of the a Roman legionnaire who went out to conquer territory for Rome. It's rather the garrison troops that were stationed around the border, the border guards, if you will. And, and they were not to go out and fight the enemy. If, if attacks came, they were to call in the hero, mm -hmm. call in the, uh, the rest of the troops, um, blow the whistle, so to speak. And so vigilance is very, very important. And the defensive nature of this warfare, I think, needs to be called to our attention. Mm -hmm. So God shields us and protects us by means of his word and sacraments. He equips us with all that we need to fend off these attacks. And we are then to guard ourselves and those we love, because we know that wherever the Holy Spirit works, the devil launches his attack. I, I use the illustration, I think, in the book of like, like bugs to light. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the devil is drawn <laughs> to uh, the reality of what God is doing. And he, and he seeks to undermine and destroy <laughs> God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. Um, but we in ourselves cannot fight this battle. We can only uh, immerse ourselves in the armaments that God provides. And uh, so I think the pastor needs to know that when, whether he's preaching, whether he's teaching, and certainly in his individual care of souls, it's always a spiritual tussle. <laughs> um, the devil is going to go to work on his own mind and heart. He's going to attack his own vocation, his own family, to undermine his ministry at every chance he gets hmm. and likewise the the hearers the individual uh, he's going to try to get them to believe a lie mm -hmm. just like the devil got eve to believe a lie in the garden of eden hmm. so um the truth of the word of god the belt of truth um, is uh key mm -hmm. and um the helmet of salvation that glorious hope that's ahead of us uh, the shield of faith to fend off the fiery darts, the evil one, and then the breastplate of righteousness, that alien righteousness of Jesus mm -hmm. <laughs> that is my my possession because of faith in Christ Jesus, who is my righteousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for the audience, he's speaking of uh, Ephesians 6.14, I believe, and, and you repeat that quite a bit in that chapter. It's yeah, super it's, helpful. It's like, yeah, 6.12 to 17, I think. There's oh, yeah. quite a few, yeah, there's quite a few verses on this. So he's pulling from Isaiah. Yeah, yeah. Pulled from Isaiah, pretty much read Ephesians 6. And if you're going to read Ephesians 6, just read Ephesians. <laughs> and then just read the whole New Testament and then just yeah, read the yeah. whole Bible. And you're, you and you're talking a lot about the real enemy is the world, the flesh, and the devil. And the, something that the devil very consistently does, he's the father of lies, is really he tells unbelievers that their sin is not a big deal. And then he tells believers that there's there. He accuses them. He says, your sin, how could God forgive you after? Okay. How could you call yourself a Christian? Look at what you've done. So, so I think yeah, he, Luther's got a fun little statement. Yeah. He's yeah. about his, uh, about the sin that the devil is like, you don't even know the half of it. Yeah. Well, right. Or he says, thank you very much, Mr. Devil for preaching the gospel to me for, because it was for sinners that Christ died. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love, yeah, like you said, I love how Luther will 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 take. You forgot a if you uh, hear some more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he'll he'll tweet some of these things. He's like, oh, thank you for bringing my sin to me to to know how the righteousness of Christ covers that. It's yeah, <laughs> it's uh, yeah, I love I love what he does um, with some of this, and it's so helpful in our ministry because it's people think that the sin of my life is yes, is what separates us, but we we uh we lose sight of the means of grace and what Christ has done, and like you talk about throughout, I mean, multiple multiple uh, uh cases in your book of <clears throat> the confession absolution of uh of talking through the law talking through the gospel those simple things that that speak to us loud and clear um that i just are you don't realize just how helpful they don't uh, like kind of cover the situation make it make it not appear but they they give you a, a a bigger horizon to see them through than just um than what it is and, and to know that my sins are forgiven Yes, I still have the consequences, or still there's some lingering effects um, mm -hmm. that are that are sure, but my sins have been forgiven. Um, and of course, there's also that other aspect I, I repeatedly called 
to the reader's attention that it's not just the sins I commit, but sins that are committed against me. Exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and suffering the cons the, the the fallout of, yep. of other people's sins. And this too is is taken away, even though I'm not guilty because of that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. against me, I am shamed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. There's cleansing and healing for that in the gospel as well. Mm. Yeah. And so I think this is a really good bridge into, into my last question. And you you talk about it a little bit, right? Actually at the end of your end of your uh last answer, and you talk about it a little bit in your book too. So for those pastors who who are who are struggling, we have some pastors who listen to this show and um myself who can struggle at times. And um I'm sure you would struggle at times. You talk about times of your struggle and kind of spiritual depletion uh and unsure of their calling so what in their congregations they they seem rebellious um they're not following and they're not growing and this everything kind of seems disarray and the devil's got a foothold and i'm sure those who are listening are like yeah that's i'm i'm kind of going through the thick of this right now and since this book is written to pastors primarily and i'm sure lay people can read it and, and learn quite a bit from this too um but they're the pastors might be losing their passion for the word and so maybe if you can end by sharing an encouragement for pastors who who need an encouragement of like how do I how do I keep going in this calling that seems kind of so against me? Well, of course that's the uh, the continual challenge because you're going to come under attack, and it is a spiritual attack. Let there be no mistake about it. You might think that it's a problem in parish administration, or that your uh, planning process is is somehow off or that some people in the congregation are out to get you. But ultimately, we do not fight against flesh and blood, uh, but principalities and powers mm -hmm. in the spiritual realm. So you need to take the armaments of God, which he provides in his word. And so I encourage pastors not just to study God's word. After all, you're doing that professionally to yep. prepare sermons and preaching, but that can almost be a pitfall. You need to chew on the word of God yourself. You need to meditate upon it. Let it sink in deeply. Uh, that is done, as the uh, as Paul's all said in the in his endorsement of my book. When you when you say the word of God out loud, because mm -hmm. after all, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So yep. you're not you not just to read the words on the page silently, but actually speak them out loud and listen to them as you read them. And then begin to talk with God about what he says to you there. That's the proper blend of, of prayer and meditation. And that then takes on the spiritual armor that you need to defend yourself against these attacks. In one sense, when, when, when you're depleted and when you're down and out and when you're thinking you're a failure, then you can be sure you're onto something because after mm -hmm. all, <laughs> if, if you were a, a failure as a pastor, the devil would leave you alone. <laughs> so he's going to call you and call into question your vocation so uh, maybe um, uh, the words of, of Paul to Timothy would be useful along those lines in 1st Timothy chapter 6 fight the good fight of the faith and take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses um, so when you're placed into the ministry um, by the church, whatever polity your particular church body has, you can be sure that you ha have this calling not uh, from, from your inner call, but from an outer call attested to by the church itself. You can be sure that God has put you there. He's given you the tools and the equipment that you need. You made the good confession when you entered the ministry in the presence of many witnesses. And then he says, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So stepping back from the trauma of this particular incident that is so discouraging and seeing the big picture in the the light of eternity um uh, christ jesus himself who during his uh, trial before pontius pilate made the good confession that he was indeed the son of god and to keep this commandment given to you to, to preach his word unstained and free from reproach because of the merits of christ until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm 
I'm in this right now. Yes, it's difficult, but I know whom I believed. I'm confident that he's able to preserve that which I've committed to him against that day, the day of the glor glorious triumph of Christ Jesus. So we know the final chapter. <clears throat> we know the final outcome. <clears throat> and then we can endure the uh, the incoming, so to speak, <laughs> in the midst of the difficulties of, um, of ministry and life. <clears throat> yeah, that's helpful. Um, yeah, I hope pastors who listen to this can can learn and, and dwell on these truths and be, and I was reinvigorated for simple word and sacrament ministry because of a lot of the, the uh, both the, the battle language that that is very real in, uh, in ministry, <clears throat> both at the pulpit and in kind of private ministry as well. So I really do hope people pick up this book and congregants pick up this book for themselves and give it to the pastors. Uh, I think it's it's helpful for both. Uh, and so maybe if to, to end, maybe where can people find you, um, find some of your work? And I know you have some other writings and some spinoffs from um, Care for Souls. And so maybe talk about that a little bit, too. I thought you'd never mention it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I, we will always get to it. Don't worry. OK, so, yeah, I alluded to this earlier, the uh, Lexa Ministry Guide. So yep. This was the first one that was part and parcel of the book that we've been talking about yep. originally. And then there's two recent titles. Uh, interestingly interesting enough, spiritual warfare. Yep. yep. And uh, pastoral visitation. And we have up to 24 titles envisioned in, in for this. So oh yeah. yeah. To occupy my time. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And yours. And, and then the, this one, at the yep. very dawning days of the pandemic, Christ and Calamity, which is not zeroed in just on uh, on the uh, the virus, so to speak. Mm -hmm but on any calamity and uh there's prayers in here there's meditations and it's geared toward people who are struggling very useful for any christian uh, clergy or lay mm -hmm. um i alluded to this earlier my wife was on hospice care and i had the mm -hmm. privilege of caring for her during her final days yeah um and uh she asked me to uh read a chapter of this book mm -hmm. every night which i did and um, frequently she would say, she would kind of breathe a sigh of relief and thanks. And she would say, are you sure you didn't write that for me? And I said, <laughs> in God's providence, maybe. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure that wasn't, yeah, that, yeah. that was probably somewhere in the front of your mind to write it for your wife, was, for sure. Well, it, it wasn't, she wasn't an hospice when I began it. Yeah. Uh, but, um, mm. It was because of what we as a couple and our family yeah. and my ministry have, have observed. So, yeah, uh, yeah um, well, they can, Luxem, if you go to Luxem. Uh, yep, we'll link all those to the show notes too, kind of the, the, the um, ministry guides as well. As they say, Amazon, your favorite bookstore, all that sort of stuff. And um, then you will find, I mentioned early on, Doxology. There's a wonderful uh, website for one and all called doxology.us. Yep. There's a, uh, under resources of all kinds of things, of both documents and videos. Uh, not just from me, but others as well, <laughs> would be useful too. Awesome. Yeah, well, Reverend Sank Bile, thank you. Uh, my uh, my email address is there as well. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so you can... They can contact me personally if they like, and I'd be glad to interact with them. Awesome, yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on, for, for writing this book. Um, and this, just so listeners know, and, and so you know, to this, actually, this episode will air right after an episode we just had with Dr. Kruger on the bully pulpit which is spiritual abuse and we we kind of played off of this because we we want to show both kind of the and for lack of a better the bad side and the good side this is what pastors shouldn't be and this yeah. we're hoping this episode is this is what pastors should be mm -hmm. uh so if, if you've listened to last episode with dr kruger um yeah hopefully you made it through this episode to see oh this is the this is the bright side this is <clears throat> this is what christ calls his his uh his sheep dogs to be, but mm -hmm. thank you so much for, for writing this and for, uh, for your work. And, uh, for, even though I've never met you in person, I feel like you're in some sense, a spiritual mentor of mine who've, who's, who's given me 50 years of his experience, which is, which yeah. is sorely needed. I, I, I need as many experienced mentors as possible. And I'm sure all pastors out there are thinking the same as that thing. We all do. It's a collegial enterprise. So yeah. Agreed. Blessings to both of you. Thank you. Thank you.